Yeah. So how how are you thinking of this in terms of? So it's obviously a short term um, impact, but is it? Will it have longer term um, consequences? So I think it. I mean, part of what you've been talking about in terms of in the financial realm and giving the Fed these kinds of powers and so on. It's very rare for government agencies to then say, oh, yeah, we'll give these powers back. We'll never use these again. And so so in that sense, it, it expands the powers of federal agencies and, the, and, and, um, in the, in, and their power over financial markets. In the economy, I mean, it, it sets a precedent that the government can say we're going to shut down things. Yeah. Um, and it's highly, I mean, I, we've talked about this in another webinar. We will likely keep talking about this kind of issue on what basis they're shutting it down, it's highly, highly questionable. But, but it's still, I find it surprising too in America, how much people are willing to say, yeah, everything can shut down. And I mean, there are some voices saying, oh, yeah. and we need stimulus and so on, but the, I mean, grinding production to a halt, should one think of that as just, it's a short term and it hurts, and it hurts a lot more than people think, but that longer term, it doesn't have that much consequence? I mean, I'll say what I think, and then Rob. Um, I mean, I think it has long-term consequences because it's very hard to restart production. Yeah. And you lose the price signal. You lose. You lose information. You say shut down in a week. So what should I produce now? What do people actually want? Mm -hmm. the continue. I mean, and and again, it's hard to completely conceptualize because of the complexity of the price signal and the supply chains and everything else. But it's it's very very. It's really hard to ramp up again, to hire people again if you've laid them off. This is why, for example, in Denmark and UK, they're paying people. The government is paying because their excuses, if, 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 they, if they fire them and then hire them, then that's too disruptive. So we'll just keep them on payroll and we'll pay you for it. Now, I think that has other problems, but there's a certain sense in which that makes sense in a statist, bizarre world that we live in, right? Mm -hmm. So I, I, think, I think it takes a while for production to ramp up. They don't know what to produce. There'll be malproduction. They'll produce the wrong things at the wrong times. You'll see, you'll see too much toilet paper in the supermarket suddenly because the last thing they remember is huge demand for toilet paper, and that's gone already, or things like that. Um, that's one. Uh, but, and I think, I think what's, you know, my view is what's going to happen in the short run is... <laughs> All this government intervention is going to, quote, work in a sense, right? So, yeah, the Fed is going to provide liquidity, which is going to ease certain pressures in the marketplace. It's going to create other pressures, but it's going to ease the short-term pressures. The government writing everybody a check for $1,000 is actually going to allow people to pay bills and do a few things, and it's going to, quote, work in the short run, and it's going to prevent people from really going out. And now how they do that, I doubt – I've got a bet with a friend of mine. I said no checks are going out ever. <laughs> It's too, it's actually, if I, you know, if, if I were a mixed economist running the thing, the, the, the one stimulus that actually makes sense, if you're going to do this, then just write checks to people. Because then at least people get to use their values to determine how it's going to spend rather than politicians doing the graft thing of just, oh, we're going to bail out Boeing. Why not? It has nothing to do with coronavirus, the fact that they're bankrupt, but we're going to bail them out anyway, because that was our opportunity because we want the Washington voters or whatever. Uh, so... I, you know, I think a lot of this stuff will actually have some short-term consequences. And I think this will be a steep decline. And I think we'll start rising. But the rise, so if in 2008, after 2009, everybody complained about everything was so slow in recovering. Now it's going to be even slower in recovery. Mm -hmm. And if growth after 2009 was 2%, now we'll be lucky if it's 1%. So my view is, we might, the world might not end in this crisis. We might be building again an edifice for a much bigger one, <laughs> right? Because, and it might be, this is the way we, we decline. This is the way we fail is through a series of these crises. Mm -hmm. But the consequence of slow economic growth, maybe negative economic growth for a few years, maybe zero economic growth for a few years, but it's going to be prolonged. And, and to go to a point you made, Anka, it has expanded government power dramatically power that will never come back to the people. Um, I, I think it's much more likely we get socialized medicine now. I think it's much more likely we get socialization of a lot of other functions. And we know where that leads. That leads ultimately to authoritarianism and oppression and, 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 and economic, complete economic 
collapse. And I think ultimately that's where we're heading. I'm just not sure it's going to happen in the next six months. Yeah, I think I largely agree with what Yaron is saying. Um, you know, the economy is not something you could just turn the switch off and then flip it back on. Um, you know, maybe after a week, things could you know, not be too, too bad. But if this goes two weeks, three weeks, a month, and who knows how long it's going to go. Um, there's, there's just tremendous damage going on under the surface. Um, and so it's, it's not just an aggregate thing that, you know, either it's working or it's not working. It's just all kinds of micro relationships, uh, all kinds of, you know, just the cash flow issues. So you never know who's going to be stuck with not enough cash to pay their bills or, um, and, you know, so once things do come back, for one, people are going to be a lot more risk averse which they should be. Part of the problem is that the Fed has caused people to be uh, less risk averse than they should be and taking bigger risks than they should be and being more levered than they should be. Um, but that, as Yaron says, that's going to mean growth is going to be a lot slower to return. Um, and uh, yeah, so I mean, it's just, there's just tremendous, tremendous destruction going on. I, I'm really still trying to figure out exactly where that all ends up um, in terms of the government powers. So yeah, so we see with the Fed, um, you know, stuff that was controversial and that they were scrambling to do in 2008 is now just, oh yeah, no problem. Just turn it back on now. We'll start doing those programs plus a bunch of new stuff. So now those will be part of their arsenal. Um, you know, in some extent, it is the Fed's job to provide liquidity to the market. That's what they've said their job is. That's what they said they, fall, they will do. Um, you know, so in some sense, you can't say the Fed is a lender of last resort and that's their function. And then, you know, all of a sudden today say, oh, actually, no, we're not going to you know, let it all crash. So to some extent, because they've said that, that they need to make good on the promise and be the lender of last resort now. Um, but then they should unwind that. They should, we should get rid of that function so that people don't rely on it and come to think, okay, you know, the Fed will ride to the rescue because they will provide liquidity. They'll bail us out. They'll, you know, do repos so that uh, there'll be, you know, our positions in the market won't crash and so on. Um, so, that, so, you know, it's the Fed that keeps causing these problems and then they rise, they have to ride to the rescue to, um, deal with the aftermath of these problems. So if the Fed weren't standing there saying we're going to bail you out, then people wouldn't take so much risk that they needed to be bailed out. So, you know, Jim Grant has this great comment. He says, you know, the Fed gets credit for being the fireman, but they never get the blame for being the arsonist in the first place. So. Can I make one comment? I just want to make one comment about trade. One of the things that's going to save us is trade with China. The fact is that China's ramping up right now production when we are shutting down production. So whatever goods we are going to be able to consume in the months forward, we're gonna be more reliant than ever on China. And, and by the way, Mexico, Mexico, there's no, they haven't shut down the Mexican economy to so the extent that Mexico's producing and people are going to work and creating stuff. I mean, I think, I, I mean, put aside Trump, but I think most people underestimate the huge benefit international trade globalization has provided the United States. I think much of our economic growth over the last 30 years, and maybe one of the reasons we didn't have inflation, has to do with dramatic, unprecedented increases in productivity on a global scale, while productivity in the United States was, was, was moderate productivity increases. Globally, they increased dramatically. And I think that, you know, the insanity right now of having a president who thinks trade is a bad thing, and an economic advisor, a, a, a pseudo-economic advisor, I'm sorry, uh, by the name of Pino Navarro, who is actually drafting legislation right now or, or executive orders to try to restrict trade with China during this crisis even further, to use it as an opportunity to bring back production to the United States, is so sickening because I actually think, while the Chinese are to, at fault to, to some extent about what's happened, because they, they, they didn't release information early on and they try to suppress it. They are also, they could be not our saviors, but they could help mitigate a lot of the costs that are gonna happen because they are still producing. The fact that these guys are in charge is so sickening and so scary. Um, and and uh, we should, you know, we should, as soon as this crisis had started, lower tariffs, I mean, we should lower tariffs to zero anyway, but as, a, as an emergency measure even, lower tariffs to zero and say, yeah, we're not going to be able to produce for a while. So please, other parts of the world produce so that we can, we still have stuff. And instead, the mentality is the opposite. The mentality is build walls, close borders, don't allow trade, you know, lock ourselves in. And it, it, it really is the, what scares me more than anything are the, are the, the people running the asylum. 
uh, from Powell, who's a nothing and a nobody running the Federal Reserve. Uh, and maybe that's a good thing because the guys who had PhDs were even worse. Um, to our political leaders who are worse than nothing. Um, and anyway, I, I, I want to give a big plug for international trade because I, I, you know, it's crucial in this context. Um, so maybe let's end with this general point. So if not a science fiction um, optimistic scenario, but something that would be realistic if people thought about it and tried to learn some lessons given their context of knowledge, which is very mixed. And as it's, I mean, from we think from a philosophical perspective has all kinds of errors and wrong uh, views, but still, so, I mean, one thing I think some people could learn is, yeah, international trade is more important than we thought it is. And are there other things that you think people could learn from a positive perspective from this crisis? Now, I think mostly crises are, um, there things go worse after a crisis, not better, but you can find places that, um, uh, I mean, if you take say Japan after World War II, it's, they learned some things, I think actually learned some things about what was wrong about what they did before. So to, to, to try to paint uh, optimistic, but not fantasy thing, what, what would you say that it, if things go the best sort of, that they can go given the context, what might happen. So, and one is people could learn to appreciate international trade and the whole phenomenon of globalization, uh, that it's been an enormous boon to life, not we need to shut it down. You know, I, I, I fear that people are learning exactly the opposite. So, because I, I see on my feeds and everywhere, I see people saying, this proves now that we need to manufacture masks and ventilators and, you know, now the list of emergency equipment in the United States so that we're not dependent on the Chinese or whatever. So I, I fear people have, have learned the opposite. But I think, you know, maybe, and again, I think this is being overly optimistic because I think I agree with you. Crises are all people, people always, uh, we come out of crises less free than we enter them. I, I can't think in American history, um, with the exception of the 70s. With exception of the 70s, because I think I think because of Ayn Rand and and people like Milton Friedman, I think I think they changed the intellectual climate. And there's nobody like that today. There's not there's no intellectual voice out there that is even a little bit, you know, in that direction. There's no to be optimistic. <laughs> the Ironman Institute. That's it. There's nobody. Um, so I, you know, maybe as things ramp up. And people suddenly discover that one of the big constraints on ramping back up are regulations, employment and regulations. So for example, if you fired people in California, now you have to hire them. <laughs> Good luck. Right. Um, and maybe people start saying, well, or, or the licensing laws for doctors, you know, they've lo loosened them up a little bit and they're allowing across state license, you know, recognition and allowing retired doctors to come back and things like that. Maybe people start realizing that some of the employment regulations a massive burden to recovering from crises like this. And maybe we should loosen some of that up. But but I, I still think that's being a little overly optimistic about things. Yeah, that, that's probably the one thing I would point to too is potentially optimistic. So there's stories out there like there was a, uh, a scientist in Washington that was running some kind of uh, clinical study on, uh, I forget what it was, but she wanted to, she was seeing these cases of the coronavirus showing up and she wanted to shift her study, her research to that but you know, she didn't have FDA approval or she didn't, you know, whatever. She was asking for approval to, you know, I want to study this instead. So finally she just started doing it, you know, illegally in a sense. Um, and so that gave us a good leg up that she was starting to provide information and so on. So, you know, the more stories like that get out, you can hope that people would say, okay, these regulations are really stifling us from doing the right thing and being allowed to do the right thing. Um, optimistically, uh, I hope, but you know, as Ron says, I doubt <laughs> that's what's going to happen. Um, in terms of the Fed, I had been somewhat hopeful because in the few years going up to this, I was starting to see more and more people blaming the Fed. So in terms of Wall Street economists, yep. now, academic economists are pretty clueless. They really don't understand how the markets work, how the economy works in terms of nitty gritty. Wall Street economists are quite good. Like they, they tend to see the details, the microstructure, what the effects are where distortions are showing up and that kind of thing. Academic economists just look at the aggregates, aggregate spending, aggregate uh, demand, aggregate investment, and so on. 
Um, so I was seeing more and more Wall Street economists questioning what the Fed was doing and that that would lead to problems that would unwind. But I mean, the problem is I was, I was hoping that the crash would come naturally from you know, the economic distortions hitting a wall and finally having to unravel. And then people would blame the Fed, or at least a lot of people would. Uh -huh. but instead, you know, the coronavirus comes along and pricks the bubble. So now everybody says, oh, yeah, it was a coronavirus. So, you know, you could never have predicted that. That's just completely out of the blue. And that's what's causing the uh, economic downturn. Not the Fed, not their zero interest rate policies, not the huge over leveraged position the economy was in and so on. So, so that, that uh, optimistic hope, I guess, is out the window now. I, I do want to warn people about the economists that are out there, the investment advisors that are out there that are fear mongering right now about, I mean, stuff is really bad, but that uh, basically with conviction and certainty saying dollar is going to collapse, mm. uh, the world is going to end. And it's same people who did exactly the same thing in 2008. Um, Cause I, I, you know, and, and it's, it's, you know, just, Try to think for yourself. Try to get information from a number of different sources. D don't just rely on, on a podcast that says the end of the world is here. It might be. There's a probability that that actually does happen. But it's nobody knows. Nobody knows, including us, with certainty, how this is going to play out. Yeah. Anybody who claims certainty in this crisis, don't listen to them. <laughs> you know, yeah. that should be the criteria, epistemological criteria for who you should listen to. Certainty is not an option because it, 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 as we said in the beginning, it, it's way too complex, way too many moving parts, way too many decisions being made along the different decision trees to be able to predict exactly what, how this is going to play out. And for those of you thinking the dollar is going to go to hell, it might. But if it does, so will the euro, and so will the yen, and so will the yuan. And it, it's not like there's some safe haven to go to other than gold. You know, there's not like there's other currencies that are better. It's it's the European Central Bank is just as bad as the Fed or worse. worse. The Chinese Central Bank has been worse than the Fed for decades. Yeah. Um, but uh, I do think we'll come out of this. I do think we'll come out of this worse. I do think, by the way, to 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 end kind of optimistically, it is an opportunity for us, all of us, to advocate for the right ideas. This is an opportunity to say, told you so, look at how government screws things up. Look at the testing. Look at the things that the government did badly. Um, look at how important production is. People think consumption is everything. Well, let's test this. <laughs> let's, let's stop production for a little while and see what happens, right? And, and it's an opportunity for the more rational voices to be heard, to speak up. And maybe at some point, I think, people will start listening. I'm not convinced it's now, but at some point it'll be death or listen. There won't be any other alternatives. There won't be a middle ground. So we need to ramp up our voice exactly in times of crisis like this. What we need today, what I call the new intellectual would be any man or woman who is willing to think. Meaning any man or woman who knows that man's life must be guided by reason, by the intellect not by feelings, wishes, whims, or mystic revelations. Any man or woman who values his life and who does not give, want to give in to today's cult of despair, cynicism, and impotence, and does not intend to give up the world to the dark ages and to the rule of the collectivist brute. Using the Super Chat, and I noticed yesterday when I appealed for uh, support for the show, Many of you stepped forward and actually uh, supported the show for the first time. So I'll do it again. Maybe we'll get some more today. Um, if you like what you're hearing, if you appreciate what I'm doing, then I appreciate your support. Uh, those of you who don't yet support the show, please take this opportunity. Go to yourronbrookshow.com slash support or go to subscribestar.com, your own book show, and, um, and, and make a kind of a monthly contribution uh, to, keep this, uh, to keep this going. I'm not sure when the next...